Can you imagine a world where robots are all around us? A world where they aren't just tied to our assembly lines or warehouse floors, but actually out and about, doing more for us than just maximizing our productivity or economic output. Can you imagine a world where robots are caretakers in our homes, hospitals, or communities? How about as custodians of our most threatened ecosystems, our farms, or our oceans? Dare I say, as robotic medical devices that we could wear or even have inside of us? I think about this world all the time. I know many people have concerns about progress in robotics, automation, and artificial intelligence. It's true. Robots as they are right now stand poised to dramatically and comprehensively shape the future of modern society. But what if we could have robots do even more? Things that could help all of us live happier, healthier, and more meaningful lives. To accomplish this, we may have to fundamentally rethink the way we build and design robots in the future. Because if we can't give robots the new and unprecedented abilities this vision would require, it might not actually ever become a reality. Recent progress in robotics has largely been fueled by advances in computation and artificial intelligence. In other words, in robot software. These advances have positioned robots like industrial robotic arms, driverless vehicles, and warehouse rovers to forever shape the ways that we will work, get from place to place, build and secure our future infrastructures, and so much more. When you look at these robots and their bodies, you may notice a few patterns. First, they're all very mechanical. They're based on very rigid mechanisms that we can precisely model and thereby control. Not all of these robots, but certainly most of them, prefer to use simple two-fingered grippers or even suction cups rather than more complex hands for manipulation. If they're free to move about at all, robots are more frequently equipped with wheels or propellers rather than something like legs or wings because, among many other reasons, they can just be simpler to use. And finally, as you look at these robots, they all are quite bulky. They can be visually intimidating, and you might expect most of these to carry a user warning label. Unfortunately, the bodies that we've given robots have given rise to some significant shortcomings. And as a result, robots today face countless challenges. Robots are bad at adapting to environments that present these systems with complex, unknown, dynamic, and even harsh circumstances. Robots today aren't general purpose. We have to design and program new robots for each new task because they don't exhibit a flexibility in their behavior. Robots suffer from very real and non-trivial power and computational demands. And as we prepare for our imminent future with machines, we need to recognize that robots pose many safety risks if tasked with working, collaborating, or just being more closely alongside people. The challenges robots face today suggest it'll be quite some time before robots can be reliably and robustly deployed in real-world people-centric environments where they can bring about the vast societal benefits that I imagine. And it doesn't take a roboticist to recognize that these challenges won't be addressed through continued advances in computation or artificial intelligence alone. We really need interdisciplinary solutions to tackle these problems. I've only been working in robotics for about a year now. By formal training, I'm a biomedical engineer, and I went on to do a PhD in material science and engineering. For as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by the human body, biology, and living organisms throughout the natural world. Nature has so much to teach us about how to build and expand upon robots' current capabilities. You see, as living machines, we and other living organisms completely bypass the challenges that robots face today. You and I easily adapt to the world around us. We adapt and are, in a sense, general purpose. We can power and control ourselves more efficiently and effectively than any robot could, and we typically welcome interaction with one another. One way that living systems achieve all this is by having bodies that, to some extent, are compliant, deformable, and flexible. 
to help us towards a world where robots can be all around us? I've been building robots from soft matter, materials that are a bit squishier, more flexible, and deformable than those used in robots today. I've been working on what we call soft robots, soft robots like the Octobot that I developed during my PhD, and I'm laying a foundation through material science to help us towards a better future with machines. When robots like the Octobot are comprised of soft matter, they can exhibit capabilities that would be challenging, if not inconceivable, to realize with traditional rigid robots. Soft matter encompasses a broad family of exciting materials. These include elastomeric materials, like rubbers or plastics, or even hydrogels, like those used in contact lenses. Soft materials also represent each level of organization in your body, from the materials inside and surrounding each of your cells to your muscles and skin. Soft materials can exhibit properties that ordinary building materials, like metals, ceramics, or composites that we use to construct robots today, just simply can't possess. We can easily design soft materials to be flexible and conformable. We can readily have these materials undergo large deformations and even cover from, recover from them. We can design soft materials that change their properties over time or even in response to external environmental stimuli. We can also use the rich chemistries of these materials, forming and breaking chemical bonds in super unique ways, enabling everything from biodegradation to autonomous self-healing and repair. It follows then that as soft matter machines, soft robots can really have incredible capabilities. We can easily design soft robots that exhibit complex bio-inspired means of locomotion that would be challenging to realize with traditional robotics design paradigms. We can create soft robots that perform resiliently in environments that we may have otherwise deemed too harsh, complex, unstructured, or uncertain for ordinary robots. We can completely have soft robots withstand blunt force damages, repair even if needed, yet all the while be gentle enough in their interactions with us and the world around them. All of this and so much more has been accomplished through a simple change of building materials. As great as this all sounds, designing soft robots is hard. Think of it this way. Building a soft robot requires you to transform an otherwise simple, inanimate, soft material into a robot. That material has to be able to actuate or move, sense and perceive, be powered and compute, all as an ordinary robot should. Engineers have developed exciting new ways of really getting these materials to actuate, but they all come with major downsides. Right now, soft robotic actuation strategies requires bulky hardware for things like power and control, components that really just incapacitate these systems. It takes away from a soft robot's softness and can greatly limit their practical use. Moreover, soft robots rarely have sensors for perception, and they can be exceedingly difficult to control because of their highly deformable nature. To bypass these challenges, I've tried to take a different approach to soft robotics design. By designing soft robots as true material systems, as forms of robotic matter, I've been able to create robots that require no hardware at all. Soft robotic hands that sense and perceive just like yours do. And I'm just now even beginning to create soft robots that learn all through new materials. The Octobot is the first robot that I ever worked on. It is a very simple 3D printed machine, but it's the world's first embodiment of an entirely soft robot. You may have noticed by now, but the Octobot has no batteries, no controller, no hardware at all. The Octobot fits in the palm of your hand and it's comprised entirely of rubber, except for little bits of black platinum powder under the Octobot's eyes. Rather than use a battery, the Octobot is chemically powered, just as living systems are. The Octobot has a very special plumbing system inside of its body that's the key to removing all hardware in this machine. This plumbing holds a liquid hydrogen peroxide fuel that it can move about the Octobot's insides. Part of this plumbing system actually acts like a simple electronic controller, autonomously routing this fuel about to different places at different times. When this soft, rubbery controller routes that fuel towards those bits of platinum in the Octobot, 
it rapidly decomposes from a liquid fuel into a highly pressurized gas. That gas is forced into different parts of the Octobot's plumbing and its tentacles, inflating and thereby moving the Octobot's little arms about. While the result is simple, bear in mind that this is a completely autonomous executed motion, programmed not through software, but through the geometry of little pipes and rubbers. To make the Octobot or any robotic material, we have to come up with new ways of building with soft matter. I made the Octobot using a technique called embedded three-dimensional printing. This is basically a free-form soft matter printing method that allows us to create intricate soft material composites. The basic premise here is that I'm freely extruding soft material inks, like those used to make the Octobot's plumbing, directly into carefully engineered fluids called matrix materials that hold these printed inks in place. Reusable molds that hold these matrices will ultimately program the final robot's form. And at the end of the day, I've been able to use this method to create many robotic capabilities with materials. Sensing is perhaps the most important feature that I've been able to give soft robots with this printing method. If we want robots to appropriately interact with and engage their world, they have to be able to perceive how they're moving and what they're touching, just as living systems do. This is particularly important in things like robotic manipulation. Again, most soft robots don't have sensors, but with my printing method, I can put them wherever and however I like in the body of soft robotic fingers. I developed a new soft material ink that allows me to innervate these fingers with ionically conductive gels. Gels that can help these fingers understand how they're moving, what they're touching, and even begin thinking about sensing temperature. Because these are 3D printed, it's fairly easy to make several of these and integrate them together into more complex hands. This soft robotic hand is one of the first that can blindly feel for objects in its environment, but only pick them up right when it's made the right grasp. Because of the highly compliant and deformable nature of this robot, we can grab a variety of objects using touch, things like trash, produce, a bag of potato chips, stuffed animals, and more. We don't have to give this robot any information ahead of time about what it's about to grab or plan any specific motions. This robot just adapts to the world around it, gently grabbing everything just right. My ongoing experiments are taking these and other soft robots I'm designing to explore greater levels of autonomy. To do this, I'm using the soft sensors I can give these robots and deep learning to help us better control these systems. And with the most amazing colleagues and mentees, I'm always helping push soft robots to meet their full potential, designing new ways of building, powering, and getting soft robots to move. By designing soft robots as true forms of robotic matter, we've begun to create robotic capabilities that we'd otherwise not see in ordinary robots. I really can't stop imagining what to explore next. Can you imagine how small we could actually make an Octobot since it's free from hardware? Could we develop one that goes out into its environment, chemically scavenges for its own fuel, or even figures out how to produce its own? Turns out soft robots are really inexpensive to make. Could we create disposable swarms of robots to help in things like oil spill cleanups or in environmental monitoring? Could we advance these systems to a point where they can help in advanced robotic surgeries as components for robots tasked with working with people or as new robots to help in agricultural or in livestock work. Obviously, this is all just a start. We have such a long way to go to evolve soft machines to meet the potential of their rigid counterparts. I dream all the time about how I can help bring together like-minded individual individuals and help harness our collective interests and curiosities to design new forms of robotic matter that can help us towards a world where robots can be all around us, helping us better take care of ourselves, each other, and this planet. Thank you.